Thank you for that uh, wonderful introduction. And uh, I assume that all of you can see our slides as well as can see me on the video. Um, I'm, I'm Dr. Viral Shah, one of the co-founders of the Julia language and um, you know, the CEO of Julia Computing. The work that I'm going to present now is a deeply collaborative effort uh, with my uh, co-authors here on the talk, but many, many, many other people who are not present here, but uh, some of whom we've been able to uh, put, put their names on the slides. The most important part is that there are many, many contributors to the Julia and SciML ecosystems. And, uh, you know, I always like to um, acknowledge their contributions every time I try, uh, every time I give a talk. Without further ado, I will jump into my presentation here. So the topic of our present of our presentation today is is seeing if we can build bridges with composability and uh, the kinds of bridges that we are talking about that uh, you know that there are many different kinds of bridges but you know broadly speaking if we think about all the things that this community right um, has has accomplished the modeling and simulation community specifically the modelica community what we have is a beautiful set of abstractions for building composable systems uh, for engineers. So if I'm an engineer, I can you know, I take all these different components from the Modelica standard library, from all the different other Modelica libraries that are out there, and I can compose them using components into increasingly larger and more complex systems. Of course, um, as many of you might have uh, recognized uh, over the years as you've been working with the system, that at some point uh, these systems get too large or too complex and they break down. And the challenge is always about taking these kinds of modeling and simulation tools to the next level. And the question that we are trying to answer is, can we compose these ideas further, these ideas of having um, composability within the modeling and simulation framework with other ideas and other abstractions from uh, things like in the Julia world and can we push uh, push harder, push further on solving new kinds of problems? So for example, Julia provides many other kinds of composable abstractions for working with large data sets, for working with GPUs, for working with distributed computing, for deploying down to Raspberry Pis and embedded hardware, while providing a set of compiler uh, infrastructure and compiler passes and compiler tools that not only provide for automatic differentiation at the compiler and language level, but also uh, really nice things like automatic sparsity detection or uncertainty propagation, uh, stability, um, sometimes also adding automatic parallelism to your program. And, and what we would sort of like to talk about today is combining Julia's composability with the composability that you have from, uh, from Modelica-like systems and seeing if we can push the boundaries so that we can simulate a fleet of uh, self-driving cars or uh, simulate uh, complex uh, uh, systems like the electrical grid, especially with everything um, you know, that is happening around the world with climate change and simulating you know, all these heating devices and cooling devices, maybe in the face of a hurricane, for example, right? So these systems are increasingly complex. And I would like to point out that um, these ideas are actually uh, not, uh, not mine to start with or, or even of uh, those of my co-authors necessarily, but they came about in a conversation at JuliaCon a few years ago. And if you look at, uh, uh, if you look at this two, 2017, right, where um, you, know, you have modia.jl, which um, Hilding and Martin presented at JuliaCon 2017. This is where I was uh, personally uh, made aware of the kinds of challenges and problems that this community has solved and how there might be a collaboration across these different communities to solve even larger problems. And uh, it, was, it was at that uh, talk at JuliaCon 2017 that uh, I personally realized what was possible. And um, you know, that's where I met my, uh, uh, one of my co-authors here, uh, Chris, uh, Christopher Loffman. And, uh, and naturally, Chris Rakakis has been part of the Julia community for a long time. And we all came together. We've been talking with, uh, with Martin Otter and, and Hilding um, and, and trying to sort of just see how, how all of these things can, uh, can, can take us to the next level. So the broad journey uh, in, you know, for Julia has been that 
we started out in 2009 with an urge to solve the two language problem, whether it was, uh, you know, the speed of uh, C combined with the ease of Python, or whether it's the speed of, uh, you know, Fortran combined with the ease of, uh, sorry, with the, uh, with the ease of R, let's say, right? So your productivity language and your performance language get both of them in the same, uh, in the same language. And that's what uh, started uh, the journey for Julia in 2012 we created uh, we wrote a blog post called why we created julia and in 2013 julia became the gau in jupiter um 2017 i already talked about uh, these three key packages actually got all released in 2017 i did not realize that until i was looking at this slide yesterday differential equations.jl uh, modia.jl and flux.jl all came before the julia language actually was uh, stabilized and and got to 1.0 which happened in 2018. In 2019, really things started taking off. Um, the team, uh, me and my co-founders received the Wilkinson Prize. And increasingly, we started seeing composability across tools. So uh, Modia, uh, sorry, differential equations and Flux got combined into a composable package called FEQ Flux, for example. And fast forward to 2021, we've been at 30 million Julia downloads and that uh, a really interesting thing is that uh, modelingtoolkit.jl has been announced, which takes many of these ideas to yet another level and brings modeling and simulation to Julia, uh, much like Modia did, uh, much like uh, causal.jl has done, um, and a variety of other Julia packages. This is, uh, and, and these tools are not just compiler tools, they're actually making real impact. Um, you know, uh, and, 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 I'm not going to dive into too many of these applications right now because our focus is really going to be on the compiler and tools, uh, which uh, I will talk about a little bit. And then my uh, colleague, Chris Rakakis is gonna jump into them in a lot more detail, but we will talk a little bit about the air conditioning example um, at the very end, uh, which, uh, which uh, uh, Chris Loftman is going to talk about. Uh, but broadly speaking, uh, we've taken this entire stack of modeling toolkit and differential equations in Julia and applied it to solving pharmaceutical problems where we've seen gains of 175 times uh, in designing efficient batteries uh, with Carnegie Mellon, where we've seen a speed up of 10x. Um, uh, these results in drug development are actually from Pfizer. Um, for climate, uh, for energy efficiency and uh, building simulation, um, we're, we've been working with uh, our colleagues at Mitsubishi Electric uh, Research Laboratory, and, and that's something we'll talk about, uh, how we achieved a 570x Ford performance over, um, over our baseline Julia codes, and then a space mission planning application that was talked about by uh, another of our colleagues from the Julia community uh, that demonstrated a 15,000x uh, performance gain over what they were doing before. And so what this suggests is that you know, there is a lot of uh, possibilities on the table and uh, depending on the kinds of tooling that we can pick, uh, in certain cases, we can see sec uh, significant improvements. In certain cases, we see smaller improvements, but there is, there is something interesting going on. And without further ado, let's dive into those details. Uh, very briefly, uh, the Julia, so I, I wanted to say a little bit about the Julia community here because you know, one of the things that I have learned during our Julia journey is that the larger the community, the more effort, uh, the more worthwhile it is to put effort into the compiler to make it do fancier things. Compiler technology tends to be the slowest moving. And, uh, you know, when you, when you introduce new things, when you refactor the compiler, when you break the compiler, when you change the language, these can have large repercussions, but doing significant amounts of work um, on, on a large compiler necessarily requires a large community. And that's why you see some of the most uh, interesting compiler work or the most exciting compiler work, um, you know, is often done in languages that have tremendous amount of users, right? JavaScript or C++ or Fortran for the last uh, 60, 70 years, right? Um, and Julia is beginning to sort of hit numbers where this kind of compiler development makes sense. So while Julia has entered the mainstream and is hitting the 20s on all the programming language rankings, we, we estimate the size of the community to be a million users. We had an online Julia con, much like the Modelica conference with 43,000 visitors to our YouTube site that year. Uh, we've seen downloads from over 10,000 companies and over 1,500 universities, but it's also being taught at MIT, Stanford, Berkeley, and all of the top universities all around the world. 
what is really interesting across Julia is is composability, right? That Julia actually composes, uh, the Julia community actually composes across a hundred plus sub communities. So these are some of the logos of the GitHub organizations on Julia. Um, and, and you can see many of them, you know, there are, there are uh, organizations like SciML and Julia Dynamics and Julia Climate um, uh, and Clima that are focused on, on, on many of the simulation things. But then there are things like BioJulia that focus on bioinformatics or something like Julia Quantum that focuses on quantum computing. But the amazing thing is that all of these communities come together on a single platform, you know, which is the Julia language, exchange ideas, develop common tools and, uh, uh, you know, keep pushing uh, the language forward. Now, one of the things I wanted to talk about is, uh, you know, as, as we jump into the language itself, right, that what, what is it that really drives this composability? And at the Julia level, at the language level, one of the key things that has really made an impact is multiple dispatch. Um, and, and, you know, you can read a lot about multiple dispatch and I would, I would urge you to check out one of my co-founders, Stefan Karpinski's talk from JuliaCon 2017, um, the unreasonable effectiveness of multiple dispatch. But, you know, if, if, you, if you're not a programming languages person, you might wonder what is multiple dispatch and, and broadly speaking, all multiple dispatch is uh, that it is a generalization of object oriented programming. Instead of dispatching on one special object, um, the type of one object, multiple dispatch picks a function among many fun possible functions based on the types of all the inputs. What this essentially lets us do is that we can design descriptive types for the domain at hand and we can write methods for the cases that we know how to handle. The compiler then generates specialized code and th this is the key thing that the specialization and the development of the code can be decoupled, that the, that the developers can write all the different multi-methods and the compiler will pick the best one and specialize it um, and that's what gives you performance. This, uh, and, and so this allows, uh, Julia's type system allows a sliding scale of specialization, right? So you could have an array, just uh, an array of anything or an array of integers or a two-dimensional array of integers or a two-dimensional array of anything in them or you could constrain the two-dimensional array to have anything that is a real number. And then finally, you could say that I want a specific array type that operates only on arrays of dimension two by three um, that contain float 64s, right? So this is the kind of uh, specialization that you can do. And the compiler can generate special code for all of these different specializations. And the more information you give the compiler, the better it is able to specialize. And this is at the most fundamental level what Julia can do. And, and on top of this are built all the other kinds of uh, composable libraries, composable communities, and, uh, and so on and so forth. And now we are sort of trying to expand this, um, you know, uh, the sphere of composability by, uh, you know, by participating with the, the users at, at the Modelica conference, for example. A very quick example. So, so here's a, a completely new vector type that has been defined in Julia. It's called a one-hot vector, and um, all it does is, you know, it's a Boolean vector, and uh, all it has is a single value that is one, and and these are some of the methods that complete the the, the description of this type. So, if you are doing machine learning, for example, and you needed one-hot vectors in Julia, instead of taking a dense vector and setting one of its elements to one and then uh, then testing for it, you can actually create this efficient data type. So that when Julia sees that the user is using a one hot vector, it will swap out the basic dense vector with your special data type and give you immense speed up because the speed up is in the algorithm, right? It's, it's literally, you don't have to test every element of the array. It's um, the fact that it's a one hot vector is encoded into the type system here. And we can take these ideas further, right? To diagonal matrices, to uniform scaling matrices, to, to symmetric and lower triangulars and, and bi-diagonals and tri-diagonals and adjoints and all these different things get encoded into the type system and, and allow you to build this, um, uh, you know, build this uh, sort of tower of libraries that give you amazing performance. So you take these basic ideas and you can compose them yet again, right? To the next level. So we started out with something that just talked about you know, a composability at the, at the method level, but now we can compose across libraries. So differential equations.jl and measurements.jl are two separate packages and differential equations does exactly what you think it does. You could have a pendulum model and simulate it. But now what if you wanted error bars? There's a package in Julia called measurements.jl. 
And these two packages were not written with knowledge of each other, but you can actually create a measurement type, right? So your G and L on the top of this slide um, have, have some uncertainty or errors in their measurements, and you can create these and then pass them to the differential equation solver, and you will get a result um, that is, you know, the evaluation of the ODE, but also the error bars. And the plotting system has also been uh, extended so that it composes with all the other tools and actually shows you these um, um, error bars uh, on the on the on the on the plot itself. So one of the key ideas uh, that I want to uh, make sure comes across is that um, models are really programs at the end of the day, right? In the Modelica world, in the machine learning world, we often like to write descriptive or declarative programs. Uh, Julia at, the, at, at its core is an imperative language but allows you to write DSLs. But however, models are really programs and one of the things that the machine learning community has shown us, right, uh, through the development of tools like TensorFlow and PyTorch is that machine learning problems can really benefit from, uh, from compiler and language infrastructure. And, uh, and, and you, this is all visible in Julia uh, with, with libraries like Flux. One of our key uh, observations was that a similar kind of language infrastructure can also be brought to bear upon modeling and simulation. And the Modelica compilers are, are, you know, um, are, are not new to this. They have been doing this for the longest time. Um, but there are just many more lessons, I believe, that can be learned from work being done in other communities and, uh, and to bring these communities together, the Julia community, the machine learning community, the modeling and simulation community. So here's an example. Um, so when, when, when Flux was written in Julia, when this Flux is Julia's deep learning library, the thing I wanted to point out is that it's 100% in Julia, right? So when Flux wants to get high performance, it does not need to go down to uh, C++, which is what PyTorch and TensorFlow have to do. Um, having been written in Python, they really need to write all their kernels in C++ and in CUDA. But Flux, which is a native, uh, Julia, uh, native Julia deep learning library, does all of its um, you know, work completely in Julia and achieves all, its, all of its performance including its performance on GPUs. So one of the really nice things that Julia has is native targeting uh, onto GPUs. And uh, these are some of the benchmarks uh, that demonstrate that Julia achieves the same level of performance on some of these microkernels that CUDA, uh, C and C++ can. And uh, this has been demonstrated to give a tremendous amount of performance in real workloads, has been run at scale, uh, for example, a thousand GPU deployment in Julia at the Swiss Supercomputing Center and it's used by a number of other modeling and simulation projects um, uh, yeah, around the world at, at many different research labs and universities. Differentiable programming in Julia is another major thing that we are focused on. And um, you know, this is, this is uh, we, we realized partly through our work uh, originally in machine learning and then subsequently in the modeling and simulation uh, projects that uh, differentiability, uh, especially automatic differentiation is a is, is, is a key part of the kinds of workloads that, that we would like to do um, in, in these communities. And that it really made sense for us to build compiler infrastructure to do these things really well. And, and that's what tools like uh, zygote.jl have uh, demonstrated. We've been taking the work into zygote and we're releasing a new package called Diffractor, which will use even more compiler facilities and then upgrade the rest of the Julia uh, automatic differentiation ecosystem to come up to speed with all of this. What we really would like to do is, uh, is take all the composability at the language level and make it available at the compiler level as well. Today, Julia's compiler is not easy to peer into as uh, I'm sure uh, both Martin and Hilding will tell you based on their experience with Modia. We would like to make all of these different things, uh, all the transformations and programming models um, or different kinds of parallelism or different kinds of programming like DCP or interval constraint programming or verification methods, combine them with the kinds of optimizations that people have come to expect from DSLs, right? Whether it's tensor computing or relational query optimization as in databases or symbolic computing that Chris is going to talk about very soon. Um, and then take those things and uh, combine them with different code generators, right? You run on a CPU or a GPU or an FPGA. Um, we in the Julia community aspire to do all of this and we are constantly reimagining our compiler infrastructure to make all of this stuff better and uh, extensible and easier. And what we really want to do is to make it possible for users to plug into the compiler, 
rather than having only compiler writers to plug into the compiler. And I would just say, stay tuned um, into the Julia, stay, stay tuned, stay plugged in with the Julia community and come to JuliaCon um, next year to see all the progress on, on these different things. But um, this, is, this is the direction that we are headed in. And with this, I would like to pass on um, the bait into my uh, colleague, Christopher, uh, Christopher Caucus. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the great introduction there. And um, so what Viral really talked about there was, you know, how we're composing across ecosystems, composing across different groups, composing across, you know, people who are working on Bayesian data analysis are also working in Julia and people working on machine learning and modeling simulation all come together, right? And what I really wanted to talk about was, you know, what are some concrete examples of how this is actually affecting the modeling and simulation stack, right? Because it, it sounds nice at a high level, but you know, how does this affect your day-to-day -day life as someone who's actually doing you know, differential equation solving? Um, and, and so the way that I wanna uh, start off by, by, by discussing this is by showcasing, you know, Modeling Toolkit has been one of these, uh, one of these projects in the Julia Simel ecosystem. And the way that it's been built is really been specific to make sure that I can bridge to these other communities, right? Because when you look at this, this is, you know, this has your standard, oh, here you define some differential equations and then you solve them. It's all symbolic, kind of like a Modelica system. And so you can do a causal modeling and compose things together. But the, re the real key here um, and, and the key behind a lot of what, what is in the Julie ecosystem is that you know, th this is not just this is not just something that is made to be a you know monolithic entity. It is something that is composing across different packages in a way that can then use different people's work. So here, for example, um, the the actual way that the that the actual way that the equations are specified is done with symbolics.jl from the Julia Symbolics ecosystem. Um, the modeling toolkit is built on top of the symbolic ecosystem. And then the differential equation solver uses this other modeling toolkit package at, or modeling toolkit uses the differential equation solvers as a target, which it then compiles into for actually simulating, right? And this is not something that, that is just, you know, one group or a few people working on. This is designed in such a way so that very diverse communities are all working together, right? So in modeling toolkit, if you do something like uh, simplify large systems of polynomial equations, you might notice that that ends up being fast. But the reason why it's fast is not because you know we're really special in the SciML community. It's because when it recognizes there's polynomial features, it's then using abstract algebra.jl, which is built by the Oscar and Nemo crew, which has been funded for the last five or six years to basically build these abstract algebra tools and so, you know, their, their core bread and butter has been doing that, that specific operation for years and years and years. And now we're using it within the modeling and simulation stack. And that, that gives you a nice integration right there, right? The one that I want to delve into a little bit more is something that might, a lot of people might not even know about, which is this integration with meta theory and eGraph rewriters that comes from the machine learning community, or more specifically, the Bayesian data analysis and probabilistic, um, probabilistic programming groups. So when you're looking at symbolic systems, right, normally you think about rule-based rewriting and, and symbolics.jl has a form of rule-based rewriting, it's called symbolic utils. And so when you, when you ask it to take things like derivatives and when you ask it to just do standard simplify, it's going to do a rule-based thing where it says, oh, you know, if I see sine squared plus cosine squared, send this to one. If I see, you know, it has these rules in a way that you can say, oh, this is commutative. So you're allowed to flip these things around. It's a very similar system to what's used in SimPy, SimEngine, or Mathematica. Um, but actually, there, in 2019, there was an award-winning paper in the probabilistic programming community, which described how, you know, it, which described a different kind of system, which was being used for optimizing these Bayesian data analysis programs. And what they came up with was this idea of, well, you can define all the different equivalence classes for a given program or a given symbolic operation, and then you can define a cost function over the equivalence classes. And then what, what this kind of simplifier will do is it will very efficiently be able to pull out the, the equivalence that is in the lowest cost. Um, so how, how, you know, how, why would this actually be interesting to someone who's doing modeling and simulation, right? Well, the way that we've actually incorporated this into modeling toolkit um, is that you can ask it to, you know, so you can design it, your cost function to be the count the number of floating point operations you would expect this, this program to do. 
And what this e-graph can then do is it can simplify your mathematical model um, to be able to give you the mathematical model that, that generate the code for the mathematical model that requires the least floating point operations, but still calculates mathematically the same object. Right? So this is something that will give you some guarantees of being more efficient. And what, what we did was we took one of these large biochemical reaction models that is read from SBML from you know, some other lab, which thought they you know, created like a good implementation of it. We ran it through this eGraph system and then we re-simulated it with the, with the uh, changed form. And it actually gave us a two times acceleration because it was able to just find out how to change the rules around to be able to give you a much smaller floating point operation cost. And you can read more about this in a paper that's on archive to appear on ACM Communications and uh, Computer Algebra. Um, but really, really what this means, though, is that this idea that was created and implemented in Julia for the machine learning community is in something that is now making the way that we're doing modeling and simulation faster because they are all working in one similar compiler stack, right? They, they, they targeted symbolics.jl for reasons that I'll get into in, in a second. But when you then bring this all together, you know, some modeling toolkits on symbolics. And so now a causal modeling systems get this, this kind of property for free. Um, and so what we really started to do with, with, the, with this stack is we started to look at, well, you know, what would modeling and simulation look like if you're to make it to be about intermediate representations, right? What, what is an intermediate representations? Well, in compiler speak, that is something that you lower down to. So for example, you know, you're, you're, every, single every single computer it acts very differently, but LLVM is a very assembly-like thing that can turn programs into a specific assembly for specific uh, chips. And so if you target LLVM uh, intermediate representation, then you know it can work anywhere else. It's kind of like, it, it's a layer that, you know, that, that kind of handles a, an abstraction below it, right? And so what we've been able to do is say, well, what, what if we make a layer so that way everyone who's doing modeling and simulation in Julia can no longer have to do, you know, when you write a new DSL, you don't have to come up with the code for how to calculate Jacobians or Hessians. You don't have to come up with the code for how to create sparsity patterns. These are all things that can be handled at the compiler level with an, you know, with this representation. Um, and even things like, you know, dimolar modius compilation passes, but uh, doing things like uh, non tearing of nonlinear systems and, and uh, differential algebraic equation uh, index reduction. These things can similarly be handled at an intermediate representation level. So that way, when new packages or when new people come to this ecosystem, they can just say, oh, this thing exists. So therefore, I'm just going to write down DAEs, knowing that my DSL will have these features for free. Um, and what, and what really starts to happen then when, when, we, when we do this is that we see that a lot of communities that never really thought about having some of, these, some of these features or some of these ideas are then turning into groups that are really uh, really helping, you know, both building packages for, for, the, for, for that uh, system, but then also contributing back to it. So, you know, some of the groups that have been very fruitful in, in, in this ecosystem have been uh, in pharmacometrics and systems biology, but also a lot in, uh, in the space planning system like satellite trajectories, um, people building causal model systems on top of this, uh, and computational neuroscience. Basically, there's a lot of groups that are now pushing similar code into these same compiler transforms, which are not traditionally like physical modeling groups, but, um, but are now using the same ecosystem and then contributing back to the optimizations to it. Um, and so there's some very nice talks that talk about, for example, at the last JuliaCon, how a lot of the systems biology community um, has all of their standard uh, file formats now reading into the same compiler ecosystem. And actually, there's going to be a talk at this uh, Modelica conference, which I think will be very interesting, um, on a mo open Modelica compiler, which uses as a front end, you know, open Modelica and Modelica code, and then similarly pushes code into the same intermediate representation and uses this intermediate representation as the way to be able to generate code for simulation that can get some nice uh, nice speed out of it. So this this is actually uh, this is one that will happen in the Julia session later today. Um, and now one of the things that that uh, that we've really done here to be able to make it so that way this is very general, right? Is thinking that well the the you know if this stuff is all about compiler transforms and if the, this is really working at the compiler level, then you could probably just do modeling and simulation transforms directly to 
imperative Julia code, right? Imperative programming language code. Is there really a difference between a modeling and simulation language and programming languages at that point? And we've been able to break down that barrier by something called this modeling toolkit ties, where if you if you actually write an ODE problem, like if you if you write a standard ODE in, in the Julia language to be simulated, you can actually automatically transform Julia language syntax into symbolic modeling syntax um, and via this function right here, right? So it, it actually, it takes this, this numerical code, turns it into symbolic. And here's just a quick example where you say, hey, let's, let's calculate the, um, the, the, you know, the symbolic Jacobian of this numerical code and rebuild, the, rebuild this function. And here we get a 10 times acceleration. And the reason is because the user gave us a code that it was allocating in bad ways. You know, if, if, if you know about programming opt program optimizations, you might know that this is not the most efficient way to do, to do this uh, simulation. But it, that's OK, because if we transform it into symbolic and regenerate it from the symbolic form, then we can make sure that we're, you know, we're generating in a way that has the analytical Jacobian, we can automatically parallelize it, we can automatically find sparsity patterns, right, because the, the, this really is saying that there's, no, n there really is no barrier between what is symbolic and what is, um, and what is numerical, right, because if it's, if you're treating it at the compiler level, these d are just very similar objects. And one really interesting uh, result that we can do with this is, uh, you know, here's an example of a of a pendulum, right? And uh, you know, a lot of people think pendulums are easy, but you know, the Cartesian pendulum, a lot of people in the Modelica community know can be very hard. And so you have to have compiler tools that would look at this problem and say, well, this is a higher index differential algebraic equation. Uh, let's transform this into a a lower index differential algebraic equation. And so this is one of the core reasons why people have been using things like Modelica, right? Because you know, if you just use a DAE solver like IDA and you throw the Cartesian pendulum into it, it'll tell you that, oh, you know, DT too small, and all the, the solver won't work. And the reason is because it knows it cannot solve it index two DAE. And so you actually have to change the model that you write, right? And, and so symbolic modeling ecosystems have been doing this for years, but we, we've been able to see though, is that you know, if this is a compiler problem, then you can probably just do this directly on code itself, right? And so here, for example, this is the code for using uh, for solving this pendulum model with, with uh, sundials and in, in differential equations.jl, purely numerical code. And if you run it, it will tell you dt less than dt min. The reason why it aborts and fails is because, once again, this is a higher index DAE. But remember, there is no difference between you know, symbolic modeling languages and, and you know, compiler transforms. So what we can do is we can turn it into the symbolic modeling language. We can run structural simplify, which will do DA index reduction and non tearing of the nonlinear system. We can then regenerate the, the ODE and solve it, and it solves just fine, right? And so this is really saying that, you know, it, 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 do, what, is, what is this difference between, you know, modeling and simulation language and, and general programming language. It's really about you know, the, what, what connections you're allowed to make and, and, and something actually a little bit deeper. Um, and and I, I go into what exactly is the limitations on this in, in a blog post, um, which you probably would not have thought by the name uh, it would be a blog post on this topic because it says useful algorithms that are not optimized by JAX, TensorFlow, and PyTorch. But it turns out that there's a very deep reason why the, the programs that can be optimized by machine learning frameworks are exactly the same programs which DA index, index reduction, nonlinear tearing, uh, and, and other uh, Modelica tr transforms from the Daimola compiler and such. It's exactly the same space of problems on which these are able to act. Um, it really comes down to the, the fact that you know, it's the types of problems for which there is a fixed representation um, uh, for the incidence matrix. And so you're able to do a full graph analysis on. And so it turns out that you know, for, for this reason, then this is one of the reasons why the machine learning community is also looking at using the same symbolics.jl for, for doing things like optimizing the code that is generated for machine learning frameworks and doing the gen, uh, generated GPU uh, code, which means that all of the modeling toolkit uh, process, as that gets built on top of the same framework, will then get all of the same optimizations that are being built for these Julia machine learning frameworks, right? Once again, this is just another level of why you get composability is because there's not really 
you know, there are differences between the communities, but there's a lot more connections than one might think at first. And so if you really look deeply into the, the actual requirements of the compiler transforms, you'll see that there's some really nice uh, connections that can be made. Um, and so another aspect of, uh, of modeling and simulation right, that we really always really care about, not just at the compiler level, is, is performance, right? And, you know, and so one of the things that a lot of people know about is that you know, Julia is, is quite a bit faster than uh, Python, MATLAB, and R for differential equation solving. Um, this is you know, non-stiff ODE and stiff ODE. Um, and you, know, you can go see the entire user benchmarks on this. Python, R, and MATLAB are not competitive, and you, you know that from the Modelica community, but one of the things that has been really coming out uh, recently has been that a lot of the differential equations uh, tail solvers have been able to outperform a lot of codes from C and Fortran. Um, you know, this excludes the 2x that you get from symbolic optimizations. It also excludes the automatic sparsity and stuff. Just simply, you know, on the bottom here, you have some, you know, pure Julia method that seems to be outperforming one of these classic methods from, from C. Um, and this is something that gets highlighted actually in one of these talks in the Julia session of the uh, Modelica conference. So uh, I would say, you know, go, go, check, go check out Hilding's talk on, on Modia. And uh, he actually highlights the, the, same, the same fact in there. Um, you, know, why, how could, you know, why would this work out so well? Um, the reason why, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of reasons, but for this specific problem, you can actually identify that the, the reason for this performance comes down to improved linear solvers, right? Um, a lot of people say, well, you know, you never should be working on BLAS because, you know, BLAS are, are highly optimized, you know, C and Fortran codes, you know, so always use open BLAS or MKL. One of the things that we found out in the Julia community is that OpenBLOS is not quite optimized for a lot of operations, but also uh, MKL is not, you know, Intel's MKL is optimized very well for Intel CPUs. But these days, a lot more people are using high-end AMD CPUs because they, you know, they actually have higher throughput these days, right? Um, but what we've been able to do in the Julia community is build new pure Julia blosses like this recursive factorization.jl, which outperform MKL for LU factorizations over a wide range of sizes. You know, so at the small end, um, it's doing a bit better. And also at the large end, it's doing a bit better than you know, pure MKL on AMD CPUs, right? You know, this is something that can be very CPU, CPU specific. Um, but what this means though is that. You know, this was not something that was done for the differential equation solving community. This, this, these Julia Bloss tools were first created for the machine learning community because they wanted to do faster matrix multiplications on, on CPUs, but now we've been able to adopt them and incorporate them as the default linear solvers in differential equations.jl. And this is one of these aspects that gives us a pretty unique performance boost that most people would never touch, right? Most people would really just use the standard blosses, but here we get quite a nice performance boost at this kind of lower level aspect. And you can learn all about how and why this is done um, at one of these JulieCon 21, uh, 2021 talks. One of the last things I want to look at is, uh, is the way that, that uh, differentiable pro programming and gradient calculations, uh, you know, adjoints come into the play. So, so when you're actually solving, you know, when, when you're trying to take the derivative of a differential equation solution, right, which you need to do in order to do parameter estimation, which you need to do to be able to fit neural networks to data uh, inside of ODEs, right, all of these kinds of operations need to take derivatives of ODE solutions. And the general way that you do this is to solve an ODE forwards and solve a different ODE in reverse, where this ODE in reverse is called the adjoint equation. Um, now, it turns out that this operation right here is kind of special, right? This is a Jacobian, which you then transpose and multiply by a vector. Um, this, this vector Jacobian product, right? One way to calculate it is you calculate the Jacobian and then you multiply, uh, you transpose it, you multiply by a vector. This is done by, uh, you know, you can do that by numerical and forward mode, mode uh, automatic differentiation. But it turns out that the primitive operation of what reverse mode automatic differentiation does is a vector Jacobian product without ever building the Jacobian. And so from the machine learning world, we have uh, about four different ways in Julia to be able to, from an arbitrary program, generate this Jacobian free vector Jacobian product, which we can then embed into the adjoint equation. 
right? Um, and actually, this is one of these things that, that is so important uh, that, uh, that we actually lob well, lobbied a little bit to make sure that this is part of the FMU, uh, FMI 3.0 spec. And so actually FMI, um, FMUs can actually generate this uh, vector Jacobian product, which then simulators can make use of inside of um, these adjoint de uh, definitions. Though it, you know, more generally, this is something that can be done on arbitrary programs through reverse mode automatic differentiation. Um, now, how much does this actually matter, right? It, it turns out that, you know, if you, if you were to look at what like, something like a, the naive adjoint from Sundials will do, right? Um, Sundial CV ODES, because it doesn't require that the user can generate a VJP through reverse mode automatic differentiation, it has a way that it, it will naively say, okay, I'll numerically calculate this Jacobian transpose and multiply by a vector. And you get, you know, performance that is, about two orders of magnitude slower than if you were to optimize that operation. On here, the test example is a stiff Brussels later PDE, um, and this is of, of varying sizes of, of that PDE. So when you get to about a thousand, by you know, when you get to about a, like a thousand parameters in, in a you know, the, or this thousand by thousand grid, you're looking at a two you know a, a two order of magnitude performance difference by doing this vector Jacobian product in a way that connects with the compiler tools. Um, and, and this is something I'm going to be talking about in a lot more detail in a, in a paper we just published in at uh, HPAC. So actually on Wednesday, I'm giving this talk. I guess it overlaps with the Modelica conference. But you can look at this paper for more details. Um, but really what this means is that the, the tools created for differential programming and machine learning, even though you can write down adjoint equations, you still want to be using those tools integrated into the way that you're doing the modeling and simulation be able to further improve the performance of your grading calculations. And so once again, this is really telling us that, you know, th these worlds are not separate silos. Instead, we really need to be working together if we need to get the highest performance for these modeling and simulation tools. One other way that this is that this is made use of is for the DiffieQ Flux and Data Driven DiffieQ stack for integrating neural networks into uh, mechanistic models, also known as universal differential equations and these uh, black box or in these gray box models where you can automatically learn missing parts of equations and then symbolically generate what the mechanisms would have been. Um, so we have some nice papers and, and workshops that show how to do this. And now this has been actually translated into the Modelica space, right? So there'll be a talk later today about how using Modia for doing this kind of gray box, you know, mixed neural network modeling. And also there'll be a nice talk, I think it's the day after on neural FMU, which shows how you can train neural networks or train neural ODEs uh, using uh, using neural uh, using FMUs as the source, and you know, so you can automatically learn neural networks that capture the same behavior of FMUs, and it's using the same stack. It's using the same reverse mode automatic differentiation tools built for machine learning and integrated into the modeling and simulation sphere. And so the intermediate conclusion that I want to give here before I pass it on to my colleague is that, you know, composing these, these different communities really has compounding of effects, right? Um, you know, we, we always think about like, what is the, you know, what is the software and the algorithm that we're building? We never really think about what is the community that we're building. And what we've really done, made sure to do in the Julia community is we, you know, we identified that, you know, we can use these machine learning tools along with probabilistic programming tools and compiler tools. All of these people come together. And so it's not just, you know, 20, 30, 50 people working in SciML that are building this ecosystem. There's actually hundreds and hundreds of people who are committing daily that is improving the stack because of the way that it has been built and because it is the way it is composing between communities. So now I'll give the floor over to my colleague, Chris Lofman, who will be discussing how some of this uh, co corresponds to, you know, very Modelica, very engineering models. Thanks, Chris. Um, so let me... I, and I appreciate the um, the sort of lead in there. Um, my uh, okay. Let me advance the slides. Okay, so yeah, um, my name is Chris Lockman. I'm a researcher at uh, at Mitsubishi Electric Research Labs, and and the particular focus that we have uh, in in our team is working on trying to optimize and design, you know, develop model based design processes for uh, looking at systems. Um, you know, VRF systems, vapor compression cycle, large vapor compression cycle systems, and embed them in buildings. Um, uh, vapor compression systems, you know, for air conditioning and, and heat pumping applications are extremely common. Um, 
And as we look at you know, sort of going forward, uh, they really, I think, play an important role in decarbonizing and, and looking at providing uh, space conditioning needs and will do so for a long period of time. But these systems are very challenging. Um, and so I'd like to describe maybe just for a minute why that is the case. So we can see in the left here, um, we have this multi-terminal vapor compression cycle. And this is actually a relatively small system. But even for this system, uh, we end up with systems with, with hundreds, hundreds of states, um, tens of thousands of equations. Um, and when you integrate this into a building, uh, we see the, the real challenge here is that we see a, a huge distribution of, of time scales. Uh, we can see the eigenvalues go you know, from you know, 10 to the minus 5 uh, all the way up to six months and more. Um, so the time scale separation is, is extreme. Um, and there's really no clear way to sort of draw a line, say, here's the fast time scales, here's the slow time scales. There really is a sort of continuum of time scales that we're interested in. Um, and that makes for a lot of challenges um, for these systems. Because what we want to do is we want to simulate, you know, this is just one cycle. But what we are interested in doing is being able to design the behavior of these systems when they're embedded into buildings, when they're installed so that, that you have multiple systems with maybe instead of four uh, indoor heat exchangers, maybe 25 indoor heat exchangers into a building with its own dynamics and have multiple of these systems all interacting. How do we design that behavior? How do we make optimize and, and specify these systems so that we can start to enable and create these high performance buildings that we're, that we're interested in? And this is a problem that we have in, that we work on in my, in my team uh, at, at Merle. And, and really, the, and the challenge is that these simulations get very, very slow. Um, we need to be very careful about how we reduce the order of these systems. Trying to design controls for a, for a system which has 700 states is very challenging. And so how do, we, how do we design, how do we go through this control design process so we really can you know, produce robust controls designs, uh, optimize a system in really reliable ways, you know, explore the behavior of the system, uh, over many, many different climate zones. I mean, the U.S. itself has, has over 10 climate zones that you need to design for. Um, and that's only the United States. That's only one country. If we're trying to sell and, and manufacture these systems to be installed in Europe, uh, in Asia, in the United States, in South America, this is a really, really challenging design problem. We need to have really good tools to be able to do that. And so when, when I uh, saw um, Hilding and Martin's paper on Modia uh, back in 2000, I think, uh, 17, uh, and then in 2018 in, in, um, in, in Medellica conferences, it really opened my eyes to the possibility of, of saying, wait a minute, maybe we could really develop new analytical tools as compiler passes, be able to get into the compilation process and look at model order reduction techniques, controls design techniques, and so forth, so that we can really enable the design of these systems. So we have about uh, two minutes uh, left of the okay. presentation, including questions. We'll use a little bit of time from the break. Okay, I'll, I'll definitely wrap it up pretty quickly. So this is a lot of the motivation for this work. Um, and I, we reached out to um, the Julia computing community and started to work together with them um, and started this RPE project where the first goal was, can we design surrogate models of these systems? So let me very briefly sort of uh, describe what that work was. You know, we started actually building complete cycle models going from refrigerant properties to cycle components, heat exchangers, using the same type of models that we're using, developing in Medellica and have used for a long, long time in Medellica. And these work very, very well. Um, and, you know, quickly going into it, and I'd be happy to answer more questions, um, you know, applying these surrogate modeling techniques to these cycle models you know, from the perspective of comparison, the Medellica model, which uses iterative refrigerant properties, takes about 35 seconds to run. The similar modeling toolkit model, which uses table-based properties, runs in about 5.8 or 6 seconds. Um, this is actually probably mostly attributed to the speed up that one gets from ch changing from an iterative property routine to a table-based. But the modeling toolkit models from a Medellica perspective, you know, as a Medellica user, these are very competitive models and like, you know, the performance is very good. Now we can take these and use surrogate modeling techniques, these continuous time echo state networks, which you can see, find out more about in a talk, in our talks and in this YouTube link. We can actually get really, really good speed ups over the original modeling toolkit model, um, which really indicates that these modeling techniques uh, really have a lot of opportunities to, uh, you know, to grow. Um, um, but I think that, you know, a lot of the message is that these tools really are real, you know, from a, from an industrial perspective, 
making the vapor compression cycle models in Julia, there's a really a lot to be said for it. And I'm very excited for the opportunity to continue pushing these modeling techniques and to try to sort of absorb some of the other opportunities that we've been hearing about this morning from the a larger Julia community to enable you know, equation-based modeling uh, and analysis uh, of these models for designing these better systems in the future. Um, certainly, we're happy to answer more questions. Let me pass it back to Varal, who can, who's going to wrap this up. Uh, th thanks, Chris, and I, I won't take any more time. So I'm just going to sort of, uh, you know, re-emphasize uh, that, you know, we have a lot of work that we are doing on all these different, um, you know, aspects in the Julia compiler on equation-based modeling on machine learning and building new applications. And I would like to reinforce re the message that we are building bridges with composability. That was, if, if that's one message you take away from our talk today, it is that composability uh, can let us all achieve amazing things um, by working together. And uh, just a final message from our side is that, you know, many of the things that we talked about here are, are part of the open source Julia ecosystem. And we bring it all together in a product called Julia Sim uh, that is offered uh, by Julia Computing. So please email us to learn more and I would uh, open up the floor for questions.